All right. So today we are going to be talking about sustainable agriculture. Um, and we're going to be taking a couple of pairs of notes, pieces of notes, and then we're going to uh, be preparing to do a lab on um, Friday. We have in here. You should have set up your blank sheet of paper with your proper heading and having the title Sustainable Agriculture. You do not have homework tonight. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and get started. So, with the title Sustainable Agriculture, what you want to do on your sheet of paper that you have in front of you, after you put the title and everything, you want to go ahead and split this into fours. So you got four boxes because that's what we're going to be taking notes on four things. So you can draw lines right down the middle and draw lines um, across, or you can fold the paper, whatever you choose to do. But you should have four boxes, and we're going to discuss four things um, that are important to sustainable agriculture. First of all, what does sustainable mean? What, and let's think about this, because you've been talking about ACT words and things of that nature in your career in college uh, ready class. Um, what is the root word of sustainable? Sustain. Sustain. What does that mean? To keep. Sustain means to keep. When you talk about sustainable things, it means things that are not easy to keep, it means that things that are kept in this way mean that these things are not what? If you keep something, mean you're not doing what to it. You're not losing it, giving it away, or wasting it. So sustainable agriculture is agriculture that is not wasted. And we talked about sustainable resources as well, which means that we're not wasting our resources. We know that our natural resources are depleting because we know that uh, our natural resources that we have are not something that's going to let be able to replenish itself within our lifetime. So we have to figure out a way that we're going to use these things to keep them sustainable so that they don't be depleted within our lifetime. So to have a sustainable agriculture, that's important because we don't want to overuse the things that we need so that they're no longer there. All right? And it was agriculture. Now, from your studies that you've already looked at and talked about and did when you talk, when you looked at organic um, studies and your sustainable farming studies, what was what is agriculture? Farming. So some words are going to pop up here as we discuss. We're not going to be writing down everything you see. We're going to be taking out the important things and making sense of them, of them, putting little bullets in each box so that you have the information. So if I'm moving quickly, if you're not writing everything, so please do not try it. To write everything. So agriculture just means farming. And this has been something that we as a society have been doing for over 10,000 years. We've been using or practicing agriculture or farming. So just put a bullet, farming. We already know that this is something that we've been practicing all of your lifetime because we do know when you go to Walmart, Bilo, Food Line, or any grocery store that you're fairly shocked at, you know that that lettuce, those strawberries, that cantaloupe, those of that broccoli that you get to that way has not grown in that little tray, right? It's come from a farm. So therefore, agriculture has been something that we've benefited all of our lifetime, because none of us are 10,000 years. So it's been around all of our lifetime, um, and it is basically farming. It's allowed us to feed many people and have food year-round. Do we need to write this? No, because you already told me that when you go to the grocery store, you understand and you know that this is the way that everyone basically gets their food. Now, determining on if you go to if people go to the grocery store, sorry. If people go to the grocery store to get their food or if they actually have their own compost pile or own farming or garden that they use, that is what is going to determine. That is going to what is going to determine the type of food that they have. And that's what we talked about um, organic food based on the food that you get from the shelves or the trays at the grocery store. And you weighed in your differences on whether which one you thought was healthier and which one that you may be more inclined to buy or do or practice when you become a neighbor, you have to make that um, final decision. All right, today's farming is very different than what it was in the past. So with that being said, you might want to jot down, it has changed or changed over time. So it's no longer the farmer's market.
market to a mom and pop shop how it used to be. There were no grocery stores back in the olden days where people would just go to the grocery store. They'd go to the market. And the market is where you had Sally Joe and, and Uncle Lou. Um, mm -hmm. They grew their stuff and they brought it to the market and they sold it. And that's where you bought it. Now we have a massive population and they could go to the grocery store. And we no longer have Sally Joe and Uncle Lou. We now have Walmart mm -hmm. and food line and Bilo that is buying their things from the um, farming industry. They're not selling well, May and Uncle Joe. It's now Grove's farming um, location. It's a big industry and they have a lot of money. So it's no longer the um, past agriculture. It's now what we call traditional agriculture. So in that same box, because we put it changed over time, I'm going to need you to be less successful. Because we know that it's changed over time, you want to underneath there put traditional agriculture and go ahead and underline that. So this is now going to discuss what traditional agriculture is. Traditional just means conventional. So in underneath here or next to it or something, you can just put a bullet and put conventional. And this is how most of the food is now made. It is no longer, like I said, a little mom and pop shop bringing their things to a farmer's market. It's on a large scale, it's an industry scale. And it's designed to make the most amount of food and the small amounts of area or space. So you have a farm, it's not the backyard of someone's home, it is in, in acres of an area, but that acres of area sells to Walmart, to Food Lion, to Bilo, to Publix. But it uses a small space to provide the most amount of food. So, with your traditional farming, you want to put large industry scale. Any questions with that? Okay. So, now that we have these large industry scales, you may have thought, like I just said, it looks like this. You got a little mom and pop shop back here, a couple of pigs, a couple of chickens, a chicken coop, a little small chicken coop. You got some cows, and that's the way that it works. But in actuality, it looks like this. When you have a slaughterhouse, and you take the thousands of pigs that are cooped up together. You have a chicken coop where there's chickens on top of chickens, over chickens, next to chickens, laying eggs. And you got machines getting their eggs. You got uh, cows in areas like this where they're hooked up to machines and they're being cowed at a certain hour. They're being milked at a certain time to get the milk and then they're being fed and then everything is there. So it's not that I'm going to go out and see what village comes. It's now, these don't have a name. It is. I imagine it's also a new, which should have played a part in your role of that organic um, study that you all were doing. All right. You may think farms look like this, and you've seen this when you've driven um, to locations, maybe driving to Atlanta or driving to Virginia to travel with your family or driving through North Carolina. We've seen people with their houses with little farms in the back, and they grow their own strawberries and milk their own cows. But it doesn't look like that. It looks more like this. You have a large area of crops, growing corn, growing strawberries, growing cabbage. Um, this is what it is has come to for us when we go to our store to buy our food. In your next box, you want to go ahead and put monoculture. It doesn't. Make sure it is below or next to agriculture. Because it is kind of going in a flow. All right. What does the word mono mean? So what a monoculture is, it's an area of land that is going to grow at a, a large amount of one crop. So monoculture, you want to put an area that grows a large amount of one crop. An area that grows a large amount of one crop. That's where that word mono comes from.
So you have a cornfield, a strawberry patch. It is growing one crop. The fact that it is only growing one crop, what is the problem, not with just having one crop, but when you have a field of crops, what's, what could be a problem? Huh? What, what could be a problem if you have, not just you, not just this area, but think about if your parents are um, having some, growing some tomatoes or some peppers, bugs, which are called pesticides. And if you have a particular bug that likes corn, broccoli, strawberries, and it's in a monoculture where there's only that one crop, there, you have a little bug that says, well, I like corn. What do you think you're going to tell? A little bug family. They're going to tell their little bug cousin, their little bug friends. We need the most corn. So the problem that this poses is it is very easy for pests to destroy. So maybe a bullet under there, easy for pests. They have a party. Like, this is where all the corn is. We don't have to go searching. This is where all the strawberries is. Strawberries is. Strawberry dies. Pumpkin patch. We got bugs there. Nobody wants to go to the store and get a strawberry full of bugs. Nobody. Nobody wants to go to the store and get an ear of corn that also has an ear of worms. Nobody wants it. Nobody wants to get apples that when you bite into it, you also got a nice little surprise. And it wasn't Halloween cupcake with gummy ones. Is it true about like the worst thing inside of apples? It is true, because that is the best. The worms like apples. As a result, if there's pests, we want to use pesticides to kill these pests. Right? So that's where we see the picture that was just shown where the airplane was flying over. That's been, that is what that is. It has to provide a mass of pesticides for a large area. Now, when we say large area, it's not a large area to the store because remember, this area is actually considered a small area because it provides to all of these different stores. But it's larger than having grandma and grandpa's backyards going, growing some stuff and taking it to the farmer's market. So basically, the farming industry. Not just the mom and pop that got a little farm going on in the back. They take theirs to the small farmer's market. People like to get their organic soil. Um, they told us they organic. Okay, so they use pesticides to get pests away from the crops. But pesticides also hold that thought. Hold that thought. Okay. Pesticides is going to be the third box. <laughs> What's the root word? Yes. And sides. Side. What do you think sides mean? Not S I D E S. C I D E S. Think of other words that have that that ending, that similar. Suicide. Suicide. Oh, yes. Homicide. Genocide. So side means killing. Killing. This means killing what? Yes. The purpose of a pesticide is to kill pests. If you did not know that, you want to jot that down in that box. Pesticides also damage soil. Because the soil has roots and weeds that grow within it, weeds is, are considered pests. So it's also going to damage these roots. So again, in this box, you want to put pesticides to kill your pests. Those are your worms and your bugs um, and your other microorganisms that are trying to damage the crop. Because again, you want to have healthy crops. But pesticides also damage soil. Denia, was asking a question. She was thinking about it, her wheels were turning, and she said, don't pesticides also? I was about to say, the soil, the soil and it runs, off. it runs off in surrounding area. What are those surrounding areas that you think can run off in? Uh, bodies. bodies of water. I would add that. Can run off in surrounding areas. Example, bodies of water. Other land. We had a strawberry, if we had a strawberry patch or some type of farm behind us at the school, they obviously would need to use what to make sure their crops are open. Pesticides. So what are we using in here that you often ask, who can I go and get some water? Water. 
And those pesticides may be running off into those surrounding areas. And this is the issue that is coming up in the news about water areas. Well, Michigan, like our water areas, and you get notes, letters, hope that's up one moment, about information about the water may be contaminated with things of that nature. You have to be considerate about what's around your area. It also is harmful to animals and humans. Animals are going to be eating or grazing the crops, cows Cow. that they're growing, pigs that are there, chickens, they're grazing that. Your animals, your dogs and your cats that eat certain types of uh, fruits or vegetables. <laughs> and the grass, too. Some dogs chew on the, uh, the grass. Us uh, humans, we eat our strawberries, our notes are always mentioned. But I do eat broccoli. Our broccoli and our cabbage and our lettuce. We eat those types of things. That's not that good. So when you go to the store and you buy cherries, or grapes, what should you do with them first? Wash them with water. With just water? And rub it with soap. It's a pesticide. You should use. Some type of, that's like saying, for instance, throughout the day, does, does my hand look dirty? Yeah. Does it really? No, no. no it doesn't look dirty. No, it doesn't look dirty. So, it doesn't look dirty, so I'm about to eat. I should just go to the sink and run some water over it. I'm good. Oh, is that like what you're I, I'm not good, though. No. no. Why? Like you know, so, you know. so why are you just rinsing your fruits and your vegetables off with just water? No, I said, why are you just rinsing it off oh, with just water? That is you, didn't that off. you didn't think about it like that, should you? Yeah. Knowledge is power. Especially since the fact that pesticides are put on there. If these germs that you cannot see are not rinsed off with just water, you see that white little film, and just because you rinsed it and wiped it off does not mean it's gone. You should be cleaning it with some type of thing. I don't really use bleach, of course. <laughs> they have organic types of cleaners or non-toxic cleaners. Vinegar is also something that can help neutralize and clean it for the community question. They say, well, like, oh, oh, the things can come more on, they use a little uh, or whatever. They oh, they have to wash them, yes. That is definitely why. Um, so should you be picking up fruits and vegetables in the grocery store and say pesky? No. Because no, no. no. they have, not because it's wrong and that's stealing. That's well, but it also has pesticides. What's up? You have a question over here? Well, I kind of did. But, well, well, All right. Um, so we filled out our third box on pesticides. In addition to talking about pesticides, if a small amount of pests survive that pesticide, they now have become resistant, which means that it does not affect them. So they become superbugs. Oh. They will then repopulate. If you're a super bug and you now mate, and make more bugs, your offspring is going to be a mini super bug. bug. Oh Meaning you're goodness. going to pass off this um, resistance to this pesticide to your offspring, which means that they're going to populate, populate. Now you have this bunch of pests that no longer just oh, leave it alone. You now have this population of pests that no longer are affected by this pesticide that you've been using on your crop, and they're like, oh, it's just a little shower. And we're good, and we're still going to eat all these crops and damage all these crops. And then those crops go to the store, and you get your corn, and there's a nasty little worm, and then you're like, what happened? And they realize these pests are immune. They no longer are affected. So the fact that they're immune to it, they have to use now more toxic pesticides to be able to kill those. The more toxic means the more deadly it is to not only these pests, but also to your soil. Also, the more harmful it is to your surrounding areas. Also, the more harmful it is to you. you. So, here, and we want to put some pests become immune, which equals 
strong, which means, and not eco, which will mean stronger pesticides. In your porch box, go ahead and put fertilizer. Now, fertilizers, what root word do you hear in fertilizer? Fertile. Fertile. When we talked about soil, and we went outside and we dug up the soil, and we talked about that whole word fertile, what does that mean? Growth, health, means grow, to populate. Something is fertile, that means it is able to populate or grow and healthy. If uh, a young lady is fertile, that means that she can be able to populate the earth. She is able to have babies. That means it's healthy. So fertilizer provides what for soil? Healthy. So that it can grow. So that growth means life for soil. Provides life. Or the ability to provide life. So it's help to make the soil healthy so that it can provide life or produce life. Um, I'm a girl, it, I'm a girl. <laughs> Cow, I can't do the owl and the ur at the same time. Cow manure is um, a type of fertilizer. That's what some people use for healthy fertilizer as opposed to what's bought in the store. That is to assimilate, meaning to be light. The natural fertilizer, which is the cow manure and the horse manure and stuff that. No, 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 no. Yeah. All right. So fertilizers again, like you just put there, it provides. It provides health to the soil for growth. And again, that whether that's natural fertilizer or whether that's the fertilizer that's bought at Lowe's or Home Depot. We use fertilizer because, remember, the soil is damaged from pesticides. So when the soil is damaged, we need to provide some type of nutrient back to the soil, being the cows or the horses or the kind that's got from the store. So since the soil is degraded quickly, fertilizer must be added. It's added to soil to give it some life. Fertilizers contain nitrates, phosphates, and potassium. Now, your, God bless you. Nitrates and phosphates are in your fertilizers and uh, along with your potassium, and that is going. Those are natural uh, elements of the earth, or chemicals, elements of the earth that are going to give the earth, the fertilizer, what it needs to be reproductive. Because we do know all of these things contain these elements uh, in them, so this is what's going to help your um, soil to be productive because remember nitrates is what contains what type of element that is circulated throughout the earth? Nitrate. Nitrogen. Um some of these sources that have nitrates, you might want to kind of jot some of these things down. Um some things are fertilizer which you have septic tanks. What's a septic tank? No. Is it like a thing? I don't even know what it is. Septic tank is connected to your house after you flush the toilet. Is that the little thing? Oh, the sewer. It is your tank that filters out your waste. Oh. Why do you think nitrates are found near septic tanks? Because dookie is filtered. Exactly. <laughs> dookie is a natural fertilizer. We just talked about cow manure and horse manure. Yep. They're not the only people that produce manure. Uh, so our uh, it has good or it can be used as well. Okay. As long as, I mean, 
They are fed healthy so that they produce good manure. Um, untreated water. Why do you think untreated water has nitrates?
going to block out another good thing, which is then going to kill something else. All right. So with this being said, we're going to be looking at a city called Jeffrey City. Jeffrey City is a location that is suffering from maybe contamination. We're not too sure. You all are now workers of a local water municipal for Jeffrey City. Jeffrey City's problem is a sprawling community, meaning it's a vibrant community. It's located on the shores of Jeffrey Lake. There are there are areas, I'm sorry, the area has grown considerably over the past 20 years. So people have come because it's been so great. It's been a good community. And so this has been great for the economy. Money has been doing really well there. But recently, some of the Jeffrey residents have noticed that the Jeffrey Lake, which used to be clean and full of wildlife, is it and a great place to swim, it actually has changed. There's now slimy, it's green, there's some algae floating there on the surface, and the water has turned really murky and dark. People are finding dead fish on the shore, and everyone is afraid they'll get sick if they actually swim in this water that they're so used to swimming in. Now, there's been some preliminary tests that have found higher than normal levels of substance like these phosphates and these nitrates. Too much of that good thing. Now, you all are working for the Jeffrey City Council, so you decide that the lake is dangerous, and in order for you to know that, you actually have to do more tests on the lake, the water that's in the lake. So in the activity that you'll be doing, you are going to be the scientists that are going to do this, and you're going to need to provide data, given evidence of, is this water contaminated and where the source come from, or to be able to make a determination and say, actually, the water is perfectly fine, it's okay, we can still use it, swim in it, and all of that good stuff. Any questions about that? All right, so on the back of your paper, on the back of where you take notes, flip that over, what we're going to talk about, I'm going to look at some things. This is your Jeffrey community, or your city of Jeffrey. This is the actual city where you have all of your residents, but in the surrounding area, this is the large spread that surrounds the Jeffrey Lake. And there, not only do you have the community, you also have a car wash, there's the water treatment facility here, there's one over here, you have some wetlands, you have industries here, you also have a park there, and you have some farmland over here, and then some other housing over here. You are going to be able to determine which wells, because all of these areas contain wells because water has to be provided there. You're going to be testing wells to determine the levels of phosphates and nitrates, nitrates so that you can determine the health of this lake for the communities if you're going to say it's a Flint, Michigan issue or we're good and we're okay. That's going to be your call and your determination. On the paper that I've given you, the wells have been plotted out. There's 40 wells. However, Economics comes to play. Your company only has enough money to test 12. You cannot test all 40. You see where this may pose a problem in the community. You may test 12 and your 12 may be fine, but does that necessarily mean everything's fine? No, there's 40 locations. But again, so you, with that being said, you have to be able to decide strategically, um, smart planning based on your studies of, that you just had, on which 12 wells that you are going to actually test. So let's um, get started with setup, and then when we return to class on the next day, you actually are going to start to be able to um, test your work. All right, so on the back of your note sheet, let me go back one second. You have the paper that looks like this. It's front and back. One side is for nitrates. If you look at the front area, get up. The back side, it says Jeffrey um, Lake Water Testing Phosphate. So when you're testing the wells that you decide, you are going to test both the nitrate level and the phosphate level for that well, and you're going to be color coding it on the front and color coded on the back for the levels of nitrates and phosphates. Um, when you come on the next day of class, I'm going to have it recorded already to tell you how to set up your sheet and then have you go on to um, get started. I'm going to be expecting you all to be at high school level in doing um, this assignment and being able to follow through your instructions I won't be here in that class because I have a major test to take that morning. Um, so how about I do that at the end of this class? All right. Um, so on the back of your note sheet, you're going to set up a chart that's going to get you started, and then you're going to be discussing with your group what uh, wells you're going to be testing. So before you test all 12, you're not just going to look at them and test this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. You're actually going to start off by trying to test three. But that is going to mean that you have to strategically map out Look at the location, use your resources from what you just learned to decide the three that you're going to test. From there, you will test.
address those three first. That will then lead you into the other nine that you need to test. Nine that you need to test. Because that if you let's say you test three and those wells are perfectly fine. Do you think you want to test the wells that are around those three? No. You might want to venture up. Or maybe you might want to test one that's near there. Because another one could become effective. So we're going to create a chart on the back, and this is how you're going to be setting up your data. Do not use the entire page because the bottom portion is going to continue the rest of your data. Okay? All right. So uh, label it on the back, identifying contamination problems. And you are working with your table group as your council. If you have two separate groups in this class, but every other class is going to have uh, more than one of your students that are in there. So you're working as a group. Underneath the words identifying contamination problems, we're going to create a chart. This chart is going to be called preliminary test location. How many um, wells are you going to start off by testing? Three. Uh, three. Twelve total, but you need to start off with three. That's why it's called preliminary. These three will assist you into the other nine that you want to test. Does that make sense? So the chart that you're going to create, a small chart, is going to look like this. And say the location number and say the reason, and then there's three boxes for the first three. I'll give you a moment to draw this chart, and then I'll explain to you what you're going to be talking about with your group. Are we good? Yeah. All right. When you look at your map that looks like this, remember this is identifying 40 different wells in the area of um, around Lake Jeffrey. You are picking the first three. Looking at your notes, talking with your group. You're going to pick one. You're going to jot down that number. Notice these are numbers. So let's say you're choosing number 16. I'm just randomly choosing that. You write that number 16. As a group, not everyone should have not have different numbers. As a group, you should all have the same number. You need to plead your case. Let's say you say 16, but somebody says, no, I think this. Then you have to plead the case and talk it over, and you together have to come up with a reason on why you're choosing that. When I grade this, your reasons have to make sense. You can't just say, because we want to, because it's in the middle of the lake. It has to be asked some supporting reasons based on what you've learned about eutrophication. So you have to be able to put that down the reasons for all three. And that's going to lead you into testing it, and then that'll lead you into um, deciding the other nine after you've tested those three. So when you come back to class, it'll be set up for you to be able to do um, the actual testing. Any questions on what you are doing right now? All right. You do not have homework, but right now for the rest of the class, you need to have be discussing your three when you leave here. You need to know what those three are.